If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 26. If you don't have a Bible, there is one of these in uh, every row. This is a New American Standard Bible. That's what I preach out of, New American Standard. So if you've got an English Standard Version or a King James Version or a New King James, it'll be a little bit different from what I'm reading. If you've got the NIV, it'll be a lot different from what I'm reading. Um, and if you've got the message, never mind. <laughs> Turn in this Bible to page 557 of the Old Testament. You'll find Jeremiah chapter 26. 557. We're in a sermon series that will go all the way through up until the Advent season, Christmas. I'm looking at the culture that we live in, which is a very godly culture, amen? Yeah, so it's just like Jeremiah's culture. It had a lot of religious stuff going on, but they were far from God. And that's our culture. We have a lot of religious stuff going on but the hearts of people are far from God. And so we're looking at a series that I'm titling Challenging the Hard-Hearted. Jeremiah was given the task of challenging the hard-hearted. Last week we looked at a prophetic message of Jeremiah's in, in uh, chapter uh, 19. And right after that, we read chapter 20, he was beaten for it and then put in stocks. And he had his own misgivings about, really, Lord, is this what you want me to do? This is not quite what I signed up for. And the chapter ends uh, where he's actually cursing his birthday. We covered all that last week because his message of his task in giving the message was not an easy one. And today we're going to see he's given a death threat for preaching. So if you're in uh, Jeremiah chapter 26, let's begin reading in verse 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah who have come to worship in the Lord's house all the words that I have commanded you to speak to them. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen and everyone will turn from his evil way that I may repent or relent of the calamity which I am planning to do to them because of the evil of their deeds. And you will say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law which I have set before you, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have been sending to you again and again, but you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh. And this city I will make a curse to all the nations of the earth. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. When Jeremiah finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, the priests and the prophets, and all the people seized him, saying, You must die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house will be like Shiloh, and this city will be desolate without inhabitants? And all the people gathered about Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Ooh, it looks like a scary scene right there, doesn't it? Death threat for preaching. Now, a prophet's job, a prophet's mission was to turn the wayward back to the Lord, back to God. See, Judah at this time period, they had forsaken the Lord. They have forsaken by, what's commandment number one? You shall have no other gods beside me or before me. No other gods. Well, they've been adding lots of different gods to their worship. Many different idols. Baal, the storm god, was one of the main ones. And we've been seeing that, yes, they're coming to the Lord's house, they're coming to the temple, they're coming to worship, but they're also worshiping all these other gods. They're even sacrificing their children. We've covered that a couple times. Sacrificing kids to their gods. And Judah had forsaken the Lord, had forsaken the law of God. They practiced injustice. They were oppressing the aliens in the land, strangers in the land, orphans, widows. They were oppressing them. Told us that in chapter 7, verse 6. We covered that a couple weeks ago. 
They steal, they murder, they commit adultery, they bear false witness. Chapter 7, verse 9. And yet they come to the temple, the house of the Lord, to worship. And they're believing because they've got the temple, they are safe. Because the Lord is on their side, they are safe. And Jeremiah is coming along and he's saying, you think the Lord's on your side, he is not on your side. It's not a message the people wanted to hear. And Jeremiah has a message. He's got a mission. It's a turn the wayward back to God. And what I just read in verses 1 through 9, we see that Jeremiah was obedient to his mission and before the people. The time reference is given in verse 1. This was in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim is the son of Josiah. Josiah was a very righteous king. Josiah decides that after he cleanses the land, after he gets all the people supposedly back to worshiping the Lord, well, he goes into battle against the Egyptians who were on their way to stop the Babylonians. And because he meddled in that, he was shot with an arrow and died. The people of the land put Josiah's son Jehoiahaz on the throne. And Jehoiahaz is on the throne until Necho loses a battle up in Carchemish. That's too much history right there. But on his way back to Egypt, he's coming back through Palestine, and he removes Jehoiahaz and takes him into captivity to Egypt. Necho, Pharaoh Necho, then places his older brother, Jehoiakim, on the throne. This is the time period. Around 609 BC. And Jeremiah was obedient to the mission before the people. He's told, he's told by the Lord, thus says the Lord, This is where I want you to stand. I want you to go into the court of the Lord's house. I want you to go to the temple mount. I want you to go to the temple, go into the court. And as people are coming from all the different cities of Judah to come to worship here, I want you to speak to them. And what did he say at the end of verse 2? What did the Lord tell him? Do not omit a word. What does that mean? Don't water down this message. What I'm giving you, you give it to him straight. Don't omit a message. And then you get to verse 3, and I love it because it looks as if repentance will stay the hand of God's judgment. The Lord's telling Jeremiah, don't omit a word, and perhaps they will listen. And everyone will turn from his evil way, that I may repent of the calamity which I am planning to do to them, or the harm that I'm planning on doing to them. The Lord says, I may repent or relent. It's the same word in Hebrew, nakam, that means to be sorry, to be sorry. In Genesis chapter 6, we know that the earth is corrupt at the time of Noah, and it says in verse 6, the Lord was sorry, that's the word, nakam, sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And in verse 7, he uses the word again, nakam, sorry. And then you know the flood came. This is the word, nakam. It's not really that God repents. It's that God says, I have declared disaster for this people because of their evilness. But if they do repent, if they do turn back to me, then I will, well, I'll be sorry for my plan that I had to do, and I will kind of change my mind. Some versions have changed my mind or changed the heart with regard to what the Lord is planning on doing. And so Jeremiah, he spoke all the words that the Lord commanded. He did not omit a word. He spoke all the words. And he's saying in verse 3, if you repent, if you truly turn to the Lord, well, then the Lord will turn from his plan of bringing calamity to you. He won't bring the judgment upon you. But in verses 4 to 6, if they rebel, rebellion will bring down the hand of God's judgment. In verse 4, the Lord says, uh, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me, that's the key, listen to me. Verse 5, listen to the words of my servants. Verse 6, at the end, um, to, end of verse 5 meaning, you have not listened. Twice, they're not listening. God's sending prophets over and over. They're not listening. They're not obeying. They're not turning. 
And the judgment is, I will make this house, this temple, Solomon's temple, with all the gold around it, this temple, I will make like Shiloh. Anybody here when I preached about Shiloh a couple weeks ago? No? Okay, two people. Shiloh. You got to go back to Joshua. Joshua comes and he sets up the tabernacle in Shiloh. The tabernacle's got a big open area and then where they do the sacrificing, then it's got this little house, the ta- tent of holy place and the holy of holies, and the ark of the Lord goes in the holy of holies, the tabernacle. It's in Shiloh the whole time through the book of Judges, all those judges, the tabernacle is still in Shiloh. You get to the time of 1 Samuel when Eli's the priest, and Eli's the priest has two wicked sons, they're in Shiloh. Hannah comes with her husband, and Hannah has no child, and she prays to the Lord at Shiloh, and um, deep prayer saying, I want a boy, I want a child, because she's got a rival named Penina who's got like 10 kids, and she's got none, and a good old husband like him, I think his name is. Anyway, he says, aren't I better than 10 sons? <laughs> no, wrong thing to say. So the Lord answers her prayer, gives her a boy. His name is Samuel. And in chapter 4 of verse, I mean, chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, we have the Philistines coming to do battle. And they're coming right outside Shiloh. And Israel's defeated by the Philistines twice. The ark of God is taken by the Philistines. They destroy the city of Shiloh. Eli dies when he hears the news that the ark is taken. Chapters 5 and 6, you can read about what happens with the ark of God as it goes into Philistine territory. But they finally, the Philistines say, we've got to get rid of this thing. It's killing us. So they send it back to Israel. Shiloh. What Jeremiah is saying here is uh, the Lord saying, this house, this great temple that you see here of Solomon's, this house is going to be like Shiloh. And this city I will make a curse to all the nations of the earth because you have not listened to me. Repentance will stay God's hand of judgment. Rebellion will accelerate God's hand of judgment. Well, the message is heard by the priests, it says in verse 7. The priests, the prophets, and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. So they heard the message, but the message was ignored. But the messenger was not. The messenger wasn't ignored. Notice what they did in verse 8. As soon as he got done speaking... The priests and the prophets and all the people seized him. You must die. It's kind of like Paul when he's in, uh, you know, Jerusalem. And anyway, that's good off topic. They seized him at the temple. And the reasons given in verse 9, you're prophesying in the name of the Lord and you're telling us that this house will be like Shiloh and this city will be a desolation. Well, they got the message and the people gathered about Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. It's becoming a mob scene. Jeremiah, you're speaking blasphemous words. Nothing can ever happen to this temple. Nothing can happen to Jerusalem. This is the place that God has said, my name is going to dwell there. We are safe. How can you be preaching this? Not only are you blaspheming, you're unpatriotic, and I believe you're the false prophet around here. You ought to die. But Jeremiah was obedient to the mission before the people. Now we're going to see him being obedient before the rulers or before the officials. In verse 10 it says, when the officials of Judah heard these things, officials in your translation might be princes or rulers, as part of the king's uh, palace, we would call it the, the cabinet of the president. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord, to the temple, and sat in the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. It's like the the rulers are coming to sit. We're going to have a trial regarding what's happening here. They're going to have a trial. And so the prosecution goes first in verse 11. Who are the prosecutors? Well, it's the priests and the prophets. Some translations add false prophets because these weren't people on Jeremiah's side. 
Then the priests and the prophets spoke to the rulers, officials, to all the people, saying, a death sentence for this man. So here they want, well, let's give the charge right up front. I mean, let's give the sentence before we give the charge. And the charge is he's prophesied against this city, as you have heard in your hearing. You're given the wrong message. You're not for us. You're against us, Jeremiah. And he, the people, what are they doing? It seems like they're God, they stepped away from the priests and the prophets. Before, they're all priests, prophets, people all around Jeremiah. Now that the rulers, now that the government's involved, the people kind of step back. <laughs> and so now here comes the defense. Jeremiah speaks in his own defense. Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and to all the people saying, Okay, big uproar. Government guys are coming down. What's Jeremiah to do? Well, I know what we would do. We would kind of soften the message a little bit. We'd be a little bit intimidated by the government. We might not speak the whole truth and nothing but the truth before them. We might omit some of the words that the Lord's telling us to say. Because it's scary to be in front of public people, the government. So what is he going to do? Is he going to change his message, soften it a little bit, or just charge on? Well, we know he charges on. He spoke to the officials. The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that you have heard. The Lord sent me to do this. Now, therefore, amend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will change his mind. There's that in the calm again. He'll change his mind about the misfortune which he has pronounced against you. You have a choice, rulers. You have a choice, people. You have a choice, priests and prophets. You need to change. You need to return to the Lord with all your heart. You need to stop doing these evil deeds. You need to repent. And then maybe the Lord will change his mind about the disaster he's bringing on you. And then he says in verse 14, but as for me, behold, I'm in your hands. Do with me as is good and right in your sight. It's kind of like he's submitting to whatever you got rulers decide, it's okay. But know this, verse 15, only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on its inhabitants. Inhabitants, For truly the Lord, that's Yahweh, has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. He doesn't dumb down his message. He doesn't change his message. He says the exact same thing he's been saying all along. You need to amend your ways. You need to change and turn back to the Lord your God. He tells the rulers, look, I'll do what's right, do what's good in your sight. But if you put me to death, you're bringing innocent blood upon yourselves. Well, the verdict is verse 16. So we have the prosecution, we have the defense, and now we have the verdict. The officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, no death sentence for this man, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. No death sentence. He doesn't deserve to die because he's spoken in the name of Yahweh our God. And the Lord is the one who told him to speak these words. All right, story over? No, not yet. Because right after the verdict in verse 17, we have some of the elders of the land. They rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people. They spoke to them. And what we're going to see in the rest of this chapter is that some of God's prophets were spared and some of God's prophets were not spared. And so these elders get up, and they might have been alive during Hezekiah's time. We're not sure. They're using Micah as an illustration. He says, Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Was Hezekiah a good king or an evil king? He was a good king. He was a righteous king. But even during his reign, Micah prophesied like Jeremiah. And Micah did not get the death penalty. Micah is the same Micah that we have in our minor prophets. 
Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. That's the Micah. It says in chapter 1, verse 1 of Micah, the word of the Lord which came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Samaria was the capital of Israel and Jerusalem was the capital of Judah, the two kingdoms. And Micah is prophesying in the days of Hezekiah. And it says in verse 18, Micah said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become ruins, and the mountain of the house as the high place of a forest. Micah is pronouncing judgment on the land, on Jerusalem, if they don't change. And here... In Jeremiah, he's, the elders are quoting Micah chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, on account of you, Zion, will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become a high place, high places of a forest. So these elders are saying to all the people, after they heard Jeremiah, Micah said the same things. And the elders say in verse 19, did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? The answer is no. Did he, meaning Hezekiah, did he not fear the Lord, have great respect and reverence for the Lord, and entreat the favor of the Lord? And the Lord changed his mind about the misfortune which he had pronounced against them. But we are committing a great evil against ourselves. Hezekiah feared the Lord. Hezekiah changed his ways. Micah wasn't put to death for speaking judgment that the Lord's going to bring. And the elders at the end of verse 19, they kind of make this confession. We are committing a great evil against ourselves. Do the elders realize the country is going the wrong direction? Yes. They know they're going in the wrong direction, that they're corrupt and iniquity is rampant in the land. But this isn't repentance. It almost looks like they're repenting. They're actually acknowledging their guilt. But I call it incomplete repentance. Incomplete repentance is you do acknowledge your guilt, but you don't do anything about it. You never change. You keep on doing the same things you're guilty of. See, repentance means not only do you confess your sin before God, but then you turn from that sin and you change direction. In Christianity, we have a lot of incomplete repentance. We do acknowledge the fact that we sin. We go to God and say, look, I sinned. I watched something I shouldn't have been watching, and it's feeding my flesh. And then we go around and watch it again the next week when the same show comes back on. Or I, I confess the fact that I, I don't guard my mouth. Filthy things come out of my mouth, and I confess that to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I confess to you I've got a potty mouth, but I make no change. I continue to do that. The Holy Spirit is even prompting me before I'm about to say something, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and I disagree with him, and I just say it anyway. See, that's incomplete repentance. Incomplete repentance is you know it's wrong, but you end up doing it anyway, and you keep on doing it. We call it the sin confess cycle. Sin confess, sin confess. I, I just can't help it. I, I just keep on sinning in this area. Incomplete repentance. The elder is saying, we are guilty of all this evil. We're guilty of that. But they're not teaching the people like Jeremiah, you need to amend your ways, and I'm going to amend my ways. Incomplete repentance. Now in verses 20 through 23... This is really an insertion into this, this text passage. It's not what the elders are saying. When Jeremiah is being written by Baruch or somebody, maybe Jeremiah is writing this part, I don't know. But anyway, he says, we need to put this section in here. It fits right here. First, we had Micah, who was preaching similar to Jeremiah in the reign of Hezekiah. And now in the reign of Jehoiakim, the same people that Jeremiah is speaking to under his kingdom, here's this man by the name of Uriah. Indeed, there was a man who prophesied in the name of the Lord 
Uriah, the son of Shemaiah, from Kiriath-Jerim. And he prophesied against this city and against this land, words similar to those of Jeremiah. So we're told the man's name, his name is Uriah. That means flame of Yahweh. His name means flame of Yahweh. By the way, when I was teaching Hebrew, I think Dale Gray was in the room back in those days when I was teaching it. Whenever you see I-A-H at the end of a name, it stands for Yah. It should really be a Y-A-H, but they put I-A-H. So we say Uriah, but his real name is Ur Yah. The next guy is Shema Yah. Now we say Shema Yah, okay? So we, it's, we think it flows better in English, but it's really abrupt. There's a, a breath right after Shema. Shema, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. That's the Shema passage. Shema means hear, hear, O Israel. So this guy's name, Shema Yah. Shema Yah means hear Yah, hear Yah. That's what his name means. By the way, it's not Jeremiah, which we say. It's Jerem Yah. But it wouldn't flow very well, so we say Jeremiah. But if you want me to say Jerem, yeah, I'll do that. By the way, Hezekiah is not Hezekiah, it's Hezek, yeah. Anyway, we're getting off track. <laughs> Son of Shemaiah, okay, hear ya. Here's a man who's speaking for the Lord. He's coming from Kiriath Jerem, which is about eight or nine miles northwest of Jerusalem. And he's pronouncing the same kind of judgments on the land as Jeremiah. Verse 21, when Jehoiakim and all his mighty men, that's his uh, secret service guys around him. When King Jehoiakim and all his mighty men and all the officials, the officials is like his cabinet. When they heard his words, then the king sought to put him to death. But Uriah, Uriah heard it and he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt. And King Jehoiakim sent men to Egypt, El Nathan, El short for Elohim, Nathan means give, so it's God has given or God gives. El Nathan, the son of Akbar, and certain men went with him into Egypt. And they brought Uriah from Egypt and led him to King Jehoiakim, who slew him with a sword and cast his dead body into the burial place of the common people. Is Jehoiakim like Hezekiah? No. When Micah comes along and says, look, this is what God's going to do. He's going to make Jerusalem like, uh, well, he's going to take you and make it a a forest. He's going to destroy it, and this is going to become a place of a forest. Hezekiah humbles himself, he goes and treats the Lord, he seeks his favor, he respects the Lord, he reverences the Lord, and he doesn't put Micah to death, he changes his ways. What does Jehoiakim do when he hears Uriah? He doesn't change his ways. He doesn't do what his great-grandpa did. He seeks to put him to death. And Uriah hears of this and he flees to Egypt. A lot of commentators said, well, he should have stayed in the land. By fleeing Egypt, he was shows that he's scared, he wasn't trusting in God, and kind of deserves to die then. I don't buy that. Do we know of anybody that escaped Egypt because there was a king that wanted to put him to death? Yeah, it's coming up in December, I think, right? And El Nathan comes. Is he a good guy or a bad guy? It seems in this text he's a bad guy. He's coming to get him. But perhaps El Nathan knows Uriah because he comes back. Maybe El Nathan didn't know that the, what the king was planning on doing. Maybe he wasn't privy to let's get him and put him to death. Because we're going to find out later in the scripture in Jeremiah that he's a good guy. Anyway, Uriah is brought back to Jehoiakim and he slays him. Now, whether he ordered him to be slayer or whether he himself took a sword and killed him, we don't know. But this is a brutal verse. Slew him with the sword, 
cast his dead body, that really means they threw his corpse into an open grave, into a grave of the common people. There's no burial for this guy. It's nothing about taking his body back to his land where he came from. They unceremonially dump him. Uriah prophesied like this, and he did get the death penalty. What about Jeremiah? Well, Jeremiah prophesied during the same king's reign, Jehoiakim, and he spared. The chapter ends with the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, so that he was not given into the hands of the people to put him to death. Here we have a deliverer. His name is Ahikam, the son of Shaphan. Ahikam means my brother has risen. My brother has risen. And Ahikam was a trusted advisor, official of Jehoiakim's father, Josiah. Here's what it says in 2 Kings chapter 22. Josiah orders that the temple be cleansed of all Manasseh's idols that he brought in. And while they're cleaning the temple, they find the scroll of the book of the law. They find the Torah scroll. And in verse 10, it says, moreover, Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, how do you say this guy's name? I-A-H is really Yah, so it's Hilkiah, okay? Anyway, forget Hebrew. Hilkiah, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king, in the presence of Josiah. When Josiah the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes as a sign of repentance, grieving. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam, that's the guy in our text, the son of Shaphan, Akbor, the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, go inquire of the Lord. Meaning, go to a prophet. Go inquire of the Lord for me and the people in all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So this group finds Huldah, the prophetess, and they go into her and she pronounces judgments coming. Verse 15. She said to him, or to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, behold, tell the man who you sent to me, who was sent to me, thus says the Lord, behold, I bring evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah read, because they had forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods and they provoked me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath burns against this place, and it shall not be quenched. Judgment's coming. And Ahikam, who heard that from Huldah, he's the one that's protecting Jeremiah so that he's not put to death. Now, why was this account put in this text? Why verses 20 through 23? Why do we have this Uriah account inserted here between Micah and Jeremiah? I believe it's to let the reader know how dangerous that time period was. That the king that's on the throne right now, that you speak against him, you speak against the temple, you speak against the land, your speaking is going to put you in peril. If you speak for God announcing judgments coming because of evilness, you're in trouble. And yet Jeremiah is strong and courageous. He does not omit a word that the Lord's telling him to speak. Did Jeremiah have his own weak moments? We covered that last week, yes. He had his own misgivings about his task. But when the Lord told him to speak and not omit a word, whether it's before the people or before the rulers, he will speak the truth. So we look at the story. And let me close with a few applicational points 
from our text. First, godly parents do not always produce godly offspring. Yet many do. That's the good news. Many do. Many godly parents produce godly offspring, but it's not a guarantee because you're a godly parent that your children will be godly. Josiah is a very righteous king. He is a true worshiper of Yahweh, his God. It says in 2 Kings 23, verse 25, Before Josiah, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. He was one who turned to the Lord. He showed true repentance. He turned and he made major changes in the land. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, and might. No king like him. Very godly man. And yet his three sons that come after him were all ungodly. And the king, Jehoiakim, Kim, he's the one who had Uriah put to death for speaking the word of the Lord. Here's a righteous king, had three unrighteous sons. And yet on the flip side, we have this man, Shaphan, who's a scribe who works with the word of God all the time. He's got a son named Ahikam. It looks like Ahikam is standing on the side of the Lord. He protects Jeremiah. He's standing on what is right. Where Jeremiah says, I'm in your hands. Do with me as is good and right in your sight. Well, it was right and good to protect Jeremiah. So parents, grandparents, God's word instructs us to raise our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4. Who are the ones primarily responsible of teaching our kids ethics? What's right and what's wrong? Our schools? (laughs) Not now. Church? Oh, we can help, but we're not the ones prior. Parents. You are the ones who are to teach ethics to your children, what is right and what is wrong. And when they do things right, they should be praised. And when they do things wrong, they should be disciplined. And the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Discipline means you got to recorrect they're going the wrong way. Parents are responsible for teaching God's word to their children. Paul wanted this young man named Timothy to follow him on his missionary journeys. And when he writes a letter to Timothy later, he reminds Timothy of his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois who taught him the scriptures. It says in 2 Timothy 3.15, From childhood, Timothy, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. From childhood, you have known the scriptures. Who taught him the scriptures? His mom and grandma. Remember, Timothy's father was not a believer. He was not like his mother. He was a Greek. But Timothy was taught the word. And I can't emphasize strong enough, parents, how important it is that you model for your children the things you believe. Because children learn more from what they see you do than from what they, you tell them to do. They, you need to model what it means to be a worshiper of the Lord. They need to see you as a worshiper of the Lord. They need to see you interact with God's word, that this book, this is important, It says in Hebrews that this word is what? It's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts, it cuts into you, it reveals things about yourself, it changes you. This is not just a Bible story book. There's a lot of great Bible stories, but this is your food for growth. They need to see you in the word. They need to see you in prayer, not just praying for the meal or praying before you go to bed. They need to see you talking to God what's on your heart. 
They need to see you in service to your Lord. If you don't serve the Lord, why would they want to serve the Lord? You need to model. That's what this text is telling us. And even when you're doing all the model, it's not a guarantee your children will be godly. But I can tell you, you don't model that stuff, and it'll be very difficult for them now to become a man or woman of God. All right, enough preaching on that. Secondly, speaking truth in an ungodly, corrupt culture and speaking truth to an ungodly, corrupt culture is difficult, but it's necessary. Jeremiah's culture is very much like ours. Sin is rampant. They do all the things of religion. They go to the temple. They do their sacrifices. They go through the motions, but their heart is far from God. We have a lot of religion in our country, but yet a lot of hearts far from God. And speaking truth can be costly. Jeremiah speaks truth. They all gather around him. I I imagine they're about to rough him up a little bit. Last week, we looked at he was beaten and put in the stocks. This week now there's a death threat on him and the crowd is coming and then the rulers show up. And Jeremiah doesn't know what's going to happen. He says, hey, as for me, do what you think is good and right. I'm I'm in your hands. And when you speak truth in our culture, it can be costly. If you stand up against our culture with regard to what is sexuality according to scripture, you are going against the flood of negative opinion. If you and our culture stand up for the unborn and you say abortion is killing the unborn, you say that in our culture, you're going against the flow. And if you stand up against the corruption you see in our governments, whether it's on the Republican side or Democrat side, there is nothing but corruption in our government. And you take a stand up against any of these issues and you're going to be placed on a domestic terrorist list. You go to a school board meeting and you speak your mind. You're a domestic terrorist. Preaching the gospel can be costly in our culture. When you take a stand for Jesus Christ, it can be costly. In all parts of the world, if you get Voice of the Martyrs, VOM magazine, I think it's free. Joyce, is this free? It's free. We get about 10 of them here, and three make it to my my mailbox. Read about what's going on in the world. You stand up for Jesus Christ. If you're a pastor in some uh, countries, it's like you don't know if you're going to live by the next week. Nigeria is really hard on pastors. So you take a stand for Jesus Christ in your school, you might get laughed at. You take a stand for Jesus Christ in the workplace, you might get laughed at. You might even lose a job if you stand for Christ in the workplace. Speaking the truth can be costly. During Jeremiah's time period, when he's preaching for 40 years, the people, their mantra was, obedience to the temple. Obedience to the temple, obedience to the king, and obedience to our country. That's their mantra. Temple, king, country. That's not what Jeremiah's mantra was. It's obedience to the Lord your God and obedience to the law of God, meaning the word of God. Which one was right, by the way? Sometimes I think as Christians, we're more concerned about obeying our form of our party, whatever party it is, than it is obedience to the Lord. Church, we need to be courageous like Jeremiah. We have to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ regardless of the cost, and we need to be obedient to the word of God. Is that our mantra? Obedience to our Lord Jesus regardless of the cost and obedient to to the word of God. Father, we come before you thanking you what you're teaching us through Jeremiah. Lord, if we're totally honest, this 
I'm not sure we would want to be alive during Jeremiah's time, even though we seem to be in that same kind of culture. Lord, may our mantra as a church be obedience to the Lord Jesus. He deserves our worship. He deserves our praise. He deserves all that we have. And Lord, help us to be obedient to the word of God. And it's there for our instruction. All scripture is profitable for what? For teaching, for reproving us, showing us where we're going wrong, for correction, showing us how to get right, and for instructing us in all righteousness. So Lord, help us be people of the word. Lord, help Help each individual here that's hearing my voice, whether it's in person or online. May each one of us look at our own lives. Have I truly repented? Or am I going through the motions of repentance? Do I have lots of incomplete repentance? Because I allow sin to stay taken a hold over me. So, Lord, when your spirit is speaking to us to make a change, to confess, and to turn, may we do that. That is the prophetic message. We're going wayward. We need to turn back. So when we start to go wayward, Lord, may the spirit of God show us quickly so we can turn back. Lord God, we want to please you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died and gave us all so that we could have life everlasting but most of all, have abundant life here on earth. So Lord, we love you, we worship you, we serve you. We pray this in Christ Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.